What's up, everyone? Today we are Lane Sharkin with Nick Phoenix. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, this is just uh, same as all of our other ones with everybody. A uh, chance for the, the general public to get to know you, hear a little bit about your journey and what brought you here, and mm -hmm. uh, everything that that entails. <laughs> well, cool. I'm excited. Uh, so first off. What do you think was the biggest moment that brought that like the biggest thing that brought you to Lane Shark? Oh man. Um honestly I always put that that pivotal point on the three D model. Mm -hmm. Cause I think, you know, when when we first met, of course, in twenty seventeen and we got the Lane Shark at Coldwater and I kind of pitched doing the website for you guys. Um that was great, but that felt like after the website was over, that was probably mm -hmm. going to be it. And I'm right. like, let me just make this model because I wanted to because it was fun. And then I kind of saw that spark. It's like, oh, this could be a good relationship. And then it over time, you know, with the uh, the dealer map, you know, getting three to four every week. And then it started to grow really quickly. Right. Um, but then after that, I kind of felt like out of sight, out of mind, the project's over. Um, and then that random call, but I, I feel like just because of our working relationship in 2017, that right. kind of a, kept the door open just a crack a little bit, maybe in your mind. Yeah. And so I would have called you every week and asked you for <laughs> stuff, but I, I didn't want to bother you. That was the main reason that like, it wasn't necessarily out of sight, out of mind, because like, I can't tell you how many times Kyler and I would say, man, I wish Nick was here. And then... Either he or I would say, well, he's got other stuff going on. We're not going to bother right. him. Because you did so much stuff for us, like you would just not ever charge me. And so then I felt even <laughs> worse about asking you to do oh, stuff. It's like I just knew you weren't going to charge me. So I'm like, I'm not going to ask him to do anything because I'm not going to make him work for free. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, when you did that that 3D model for us, that was really cool because it was you didn't even tell me about it. You're just like, hey, I want you to come see some stuff and then had it out there. Because I built the Lane Shark off of scratching it out on right, paper, right. and then whenever you turned it into that 3D model, it was it was really cool. And I I've always appreciated how you've gone above and beyond, and like and then obviously now that you work here, it's it's tenfold like that. Oh, that's exciting! Like every yeah. time I ask you to do something, you're like, okay, that's already done, and I've done it like five steps ahead. So, <laughs> uh, what do you want me to do next? So that's a really can't can't thank you enough for all that. Oh man, it's it's always exciting to get a new project, especially here, because you know the entire team's always excited about the next thing. And yeah, trying to move forward, and which you know that makes this work environment so much more enjoyable because nothing's stagnant. You know, once we get to the goal that we reach, and mm -hmm. then we take it five steps further, and then ten steps further. I mean, look what's happening across mm -hmm. the parking lot right now. It's yeah. like I know you're excited, probably a little nervous at the same time, but also it's I mean. Five years ago, did you think that was going to be a, a thing? Not at all. <laughs> I, I mean, no, not at all. And But, yeah, let's, talking about nervous, so and you coming over there this morning and, like, walking me through the stuff that I forgot and, like, all of my nerves calmed after that because, like, you, there was, like, little things that I just couldn't remember how to start. Right. Uh, and then so people understand we're talking about programming the robot. So... Uh, you and I went to that class together and I knew that you were the person I needed to take <laughs> because you would be the one that like absorbed everything. And, uh, but yeah, it just reminded me of those little steps this morning. It's like completely calmed my nerves on it. I'm not necessarily afraid of it. Like I, I was yesterday and, um, actually, or was it yesterday morning? So I'm thinking yeah. a day, a, a day apart, but either way. Um, so yeah, I mean, we went, what was it six months ago? It was October. Yeah. Was it? No, it was September 11th that we were there. Oh, wow. At yeah, I, yeah. Cause I was looking at pictures the other day and, uh, that was a fun trip because we got to go and we went up there and completely changed our approach at the right. end, at the end of the trip. We were like, so we went up there for the cobots and then just completely switched it all to yeah. industrial robots. Right at the last day too. And the, but we the were, last hour. We were literally getting ready to leave <laughs> and that one guy... Right. That uh, worked for Stefan Darley told us about yeah. OTC. Which overall, I think, best move probably could have been made is to get the industrial bots, not the cobots. Because the cobots definitely have their place in, in this industry and in manufacturing in general. But 
maybe just a little too lightweight, a little too slow for right. mass production. Uh, yeah, for the type of volume that we're trying to turn out, it wouldn't. I just don't think it would have worked. Yeah, I've, I've I think about it a lot, and like just, and for the money, it was basically the same amount of money once you got everything you needed to run it. Right. It was the same money, and this will turn out way mm -hmm. faster. Right. Than what we were looking at. So anyway, uh, I kind of want to go back. Um, I've no, I've mentioned in some other podcasts, I always call you our wizard because you just there's really nothing that you. I don't even think there's anything you've ever said. No, I can't do that. Or you, if you have, you said I can't do that yet. What in your life made you to where you just always want to figure things out? Like, is there a moment or a, a thing in your childhood or anything like that? Like, what can't, made you who you are? I guess is what I'm. <laughs> that's little, a tough question. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any direct moment or or time but mm -hmm. just curiosity i mean right. i'm always curious what, what could happen you know what's what's going to happen um personally i'm not a big risk taker but i'm willing to try something i'm willing to fail because that's how i learn um so when i tell you like yeah, i don't know that yet but there's resources out there because other people do it so mm -hmm. why not take that chance um so yeah as a kid it was always just taking things apart you know mainly electronic things mm -hmm. uh, just remember all these odd gadgets and, you know, like Walkman CD players. They were so mechanical, but also electronic. So mm -hmm. there's moving parts, but also with electronic, you can't really see what's happening, like boards and, you know, the programming side of it, which is really fascinating. So I think just taking on puzzles and projects like that and being curious about learning things um, and, and building things, creating anything from nothing or from you know, different materials mm -hmm. has always been really fascinating to me. Um, so uh, that's one thing. So we're very similar in that aspect right up until you get to the electronics part <laughs> because I would always, I love tearing apart mechanical stuff, right? Like analog. Mm -hmm. But because I could never, I never even could figure out how to even begin with the electronic stuff. So what, did you have someone that knew electronics that taught you how to like, start down that or did you just not all necessarily stuff? yeah and honestly i don't know that much about it i just tinker you know plug it in here mm -hmm. test this do a lot of reading um but growing up my parents and, and grandparents for that you know, matter is they were always encouraging to just learn things try things mm -hmm. um so my dad taught at shop back in uh he taught high school shop and then my grandfather was a mechanical engineer or civil engineer, brother's a mechanical engineer, uh, my uncle's an engineer. So a lot of tinkers in the family. Um, so that was really encouraged, like getting in the wood shop at a young age and right. Boy Scouts, you know, the Pinewood Derby type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember one specific project in, I think, third grade. We had to build a lunchbox with an alarm system on it. It's so like when it opened. Oh, yeah. um, so mine was basically a lunchbox filled with wires right it didn't work that great but <laughs> it was fun to build and kind of tinker with that so all of those little things started leading me to just try things yeah um i definitely damaged a lot of electronics well it's part of it <laughs> it's a part of it so yeah yeah i um i definitely could just i just never did get into electronics until i got out of high school when i started working at the um place called acs and we did we built electrical control panels for all kinds of stuff and that's when i started understanding electronics hmm. that's what gave me the the foundation to be able to make those which the switch box that we do and the handle it's not really that complicated but it still gave me the ability to build that like right i um I have a video of like where i was recording myself when i first started making that switch mm -hmm. box like the internals of it and I put it all together, turn it on. I'm like walking through it, pull the power, it resets itself, and I turn it back on. And then I'm like, okay, but I can't turn it off. And it like <laughs> just completely like aggravated the heck out of me. And then it was just like, well, you just have to add a second switch to the to the power side and just kill it. But like little things like that, I um, I've always enjoyed doing. And I think I was just rambling. I don't know where I was going with that. But right. But like when you accomplish something like that and you get that aha moment. Yeah. I mean, to me, that is like I chase that 
that little dopamine hit where you're like, man, I figured it out. Like you yep. figure the puzzle out. Like this morning, whenever we got that second weld to actually right, look right. right. Yeah. It felt, <laughs> felt very good to yep. just say, okay, we've got this robot welding. Now. Right. Yep. Yeah. Those aha moments are the best because without those, it's just boring. Right. So, all right. So growing up, you play with electronics, you tore apart everything. And then, um, so where did you go? You went to South Florida after high school? So Full Sail University in Orlando. And that was the graphic design? Yeah, so they're big focus. They're essentially a uh, like a vocational school for digital arts. Mm-hmm. So anything from um, audio recording, you know, graphic design, film. They're, they're pretty well known for film and music. Um, and so, that's the one where you had like that really crazy schedule, right? Yeah. So I got there um, in 2009 in August, and I graduated in April of 2011. So about 21 months, eight hours roughly every day, uh, weekend classes. Some classes would start at one in the morning and end at nine in the morning. So like overnight, their whole pitch was this is real world industry, you know, mm-hmm. like in this industry, you may be working these crazy hours, which they're not wrong. Right. It felt more like a, uh, you know, a farm, you right. just get, get students in, get them out, which I honestly appreciated because I could stay focused, get the projects done, go to the next class. And it, it was hyper focused. There was no, you know, outside courses that didn't really seem necessary. I had yeah, no, one English, filler, filler yeah, classes one English, one math. Um, and then it was all, design-based stuff. And so was it five days a week or? S- five to seven days a week. Se- five, okay, yeah. five to seven. I think we got two or three breaks, maybe a couple and, days off and Christmas. What was the what was the success rate on that, that place? <laughs> the dropout rate was real high. Um, I started with 100 plus students and graduated with the same 13 of them. That's insane. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, kids coming from high school directly into that, typically aren't used to that type of a schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're late for two classes, you fail that month. So you have to take that class again. And they really harp on it. It's like each class is a month long, essentially? Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yeah, one to three months, depending on what it is. Like the 3D program was three months, which that was, you know, really the reason I wanted to go there was for 3D. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, a lot of students either stayed back or completely just left the program. Uh, That's insane. It was intense, but... Like I said, but, I would, you, but you made it through it. So oh, yeah, I, I loved it. And I, I really thrived in that because I wanted to stay focused on it. So uh, it sounds like we need to give Nick more work. Well, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here enough. <laughs> I know now that I get the notifications right. on the alarm, it's like every morning at six o'clock, Nick Phoenix, un, unlock the front door. <laughs> so that's uh, greatly appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> so you graduated from there and... You stayed down there for a little while, or did you immediately? So I went back to New York, uh, Watkins Glen, where okay. I was born and raised. Um, really well known for NASCAR is the the road circuits up there. Um, so I went back for about six months, and then took a big trip around the U.S. A, a big road trip with a friend. Um, That's with your buddy that you went and saw just recently. Yeah, 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 Jeff. Um, yeah, so drove around the U.S., spent some time out west. Um, Really trying to figure out what the next thing was. So looking for jobs out there, Mm -hmm. mainly in in design, but nothing felt just right. It didn't really pan out. Um, Probably too young, a little lost, trying to, you know, figure life out. Um, And then found a job in Port Charlotte, South Florida. That's right. Okay. Um, Did not have the best time down there. Uh Um, The job was designed, but man, I was in a office maybe seven feet by 10 feet with another person. (laughs) So not great, really low pay. Um, so just getting my feet wet in that industry. And that kind of drove me to say, all right, I'm, I'm going to go learn how to farm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's when I hopped on a bicycle and found a guy through um, Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. Acronym is WOOF. Uh, <laughs> and we... Woof. <Woo-woof>. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> so we, we set out from South Florida on bikes and rode up through on bicycles 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 yeah. i had a really inexpensive mountain bike right. uh, with a kid's car hauler one of those like covered wagon trailer things mm-hmm. that i just chopped down to the bare bones and put a big tupperware in wrapped up as much stuff as i could laptop camera and some clothes and food and just set off um and after about a month 
five different farms, 800 miles. We landed in Milton, about an mm -hmm. hour from here, and that's where cold water started. And so what year was that that you got the cold water? 2012. Okay, yeah. so 2012 to 2000, was it 21 or 22 that you came here? Uh, 20, 22. Okay, so ten, yeah. 10 years there. Yeah, yeah, just about 10 years on site living there. Yeah. That's so crazy. Like, I, whenever all the times coming out there and seeing you and talking to you, I never really thought that you would leave that place. Me either. <laughs> and I guess if, I guess probably if they hadn't sold, if he hadn't sold it to the, like, yeah, he was kind of the the guy that started it. Like y'all started it together, kind of right? No, so I came in. Um, there were some other people that had the idea, and okay. they were friends with Rusty, the, Rusty, the yeah. previous owner. So when I came in, it the, the foundation was there, the mm -hmm. idea, the land, some of the roads and trails, um, the gardens were there. So I kind of came in at an interesting point because it was just slow rolling. Right. Um, the volunteer program, which I was a part of hadn't really gotten kicked off fully yet. Um, so there's a lot of growth opportunity. Yeah. You know, I saw, okay, they need help with this. They need help with that. And you're living there, you're living in the woods. What else are you going to do? Um, and then they said, well, we need a website. I'm like, mm -hmm. Well, I'll do that, but can I stay and can you pay me? Yeah. Because at the time I was volunteering. Um, and then one, one thing led to another and took on more responsibilities and just stayed. So one month turned into 10 years eventually. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a really cool place. Um, I, I I really like the um, the hydroponic <clears throat> gardens. Yeah, where uh, you have Brandon, the fish and the pumps pull, and all that. Pull that up, that cold water folder. Yeah, so that's the aquaponics, which was really the what did I say? Hydroponics. Well, so we had hydroponics also. What's um, the difference? So fish. Okay. Um, a, aquatic life basically. Um, so essentially, the the aquaponics was the big the cool thing mm -hmm. in the gardens that we really taught and, and kind of use that as our central um, teaching point okay. um, because it, it, it's pretty fascinating. It's unique. It, it's a complete waste of energy. Um, in Florida, you have good soil, you have sun, oh. you have water. <laughs> it's like in the desert. Sure. This, this is a cool system because uh, it's a, it's a closed loop. Cause uh, I feel like I've seen like a, a apocalyptic type movie, apocalyptic exactly. type movies right. where they have a lot of that. Right. So that's why it's because the soil, if this, if you have shitty soil, you use that. Right. To... So think, you know, Arizona, okay. you can't really go out and just plant a tomato plant in the ground. Right. Yeah. So a, a closed loop system like this is, uh, is, gotcha. is worth it. Um, but really fascinating. I mean, they're the early founders of Coldwater who were um, partnered with Rusty at the time. Mm -hmm. he, he was pretty techy and had a lot of interesting ideas. The sustainability uh, from aquaponics, hydroponics, you know, composting toilets, stuff like that. Uh, but a lot of those hopes and dreams for sustainability aren't as practical when it's a business mm, on, yeah. on large scale because yeah. um, there's not a lot of return in it. And that, and that was kind of the balance that we were trying to find with cold water as a business. Um, Cause if you're just a garden, you can do whatever you want, but when you need to make money, right. it, it turns into a whole different ball game. Yeah. And y'all, you know, would y'all have like weddings out there once a month or just kind of sporadic? <laughs> Sometimes four or five in a month really? uh, during our peak. That was yeah. like the bane of your existence. Wasn't yes. It? Uh, I, I really enjoyed having weddings and it was a great feeling to, you know, see people celebrating mm -hmm. one of the most important days of their lives right there with us. Right. And we had hundreds of weddings, but staying up until two, three in the morning, cleaning up trash, going to bed and then waking up and having to be on because living on site, I had the work phone yep. all the time. So a really kind of a toxic relationship that I had with, with work at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, but man, it was, it was enjoyable for sure. Um, I learned more trade skills, more crafts, more how to be me right. at Coldwater than than any other place that I can really consider now in my life. Um, yeah, because you got to do all that stuff, and then you can still, I guess, sort of moonlight and do the um, website stuff, and then right, right. obviously helped us out in the very yeah. beginning. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I can say, man, whenever. Uh, I forget what it was. I guess Kyler, he was getting to where he couldn't keep, couldn't really keep up with all the IT stuff, and he's like, he's like, we ought to call Nick. I was like, I, I laughed at him. I was like, <laughs> I would love for Nick to come work here, but right. he's never leaving Coldwater. And you called me, and he called me at, at 
absolutely like down to the minute the best time yeah. i was in the parking lot of bagel heads uh, <laughs> getting some breakfast sandwiches helping um katie my partner at um first city and we had just talked that week about you know what's the next thing like all right cold water's not not it right now mm-hmm. she was trying to figure out what she wanted to do um and as soon as i got that call i was like oh they just need website stuff and he's like do you want to work and i was like Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I was like, all right, let's figure this out. Um, That's funny. That's what, like, Ross said whenever I <laughs> right. called him. It was like... And your timing's perfect. <laughs> yeah. I got... I, I actually reached out to someone a couple weeks ago. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping my timing's perfect on her, but I'm waiting on this this European distributor. Oh, right. Because if, if we get that, we're going to bring Laura... I think you've met Laura. She was she used to own the UPS store. Okay, I... I don't, I don't know. I don't recall. Yeah. But she's really cool. Um, and I think she'd be a great fit here. So I'm hoping the European stuff works out and we'll bring her in. Cause, cause that was kind of the the same. Like when I called her, she kind of like said the (laughs) same thing. She's like, I'm not really looking, but I've been kind of thinking about it. Cause she, everybody I talk to nowadays are like, well, all the stuff you're doing on social media, like it's so awesome. Like thanks to Brandon. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, she's like, yeah, I just saw your stuff last week and I was just thinking how cool it would be to work there. And I'm like, well, this might work out. Nice. Then. So hopefully that, hopefully that stuff turns out to yeah. not be a scam. I'm still, I still believe it's a scam the way that I, oh, I think it's real. You do? Yeah. I think it's real. I think they're just disorganized. Just distor- dis- yeah. Well, that's, that's sad. Which is, I'm hoping, you know, a little unsettling yeah. for sure. If you're going to get into business with them, but I, I think it's legit. Well, <laughs> I'll I'll take I'll take that as a win right now because it's I I still I'm I'm about seventy five percent convinced that it's a scam. Oh man, but it's better than being one hundred percent convinced. Right, right. So we'll see we'll see how that works out. Um, so yeah, if we if that if that happens, uh, you're gonna have to learn a lot of European uh, ins and outs of how to take care of customer service. I, I'm reading care. up. I'm reading up. But I think you and Brandon are like the most. <laughs> prepared and or nervous about it trying to be prepared yeah i uh like i say once i'm i think once i'm 100 percent convinced that it's not a scam once we get the first purchase order right then i'll i'll be a little more worried about it but uh hopefully that turns into something that would that'd be really cool to get it i think regardless anywhere. it's it's opening up a lot more you know thought in in growth that way right. in that direction so yeah if, the, if this doesn't work out we'll have to find someone that can actually get us over there right. and then try to figure out how to get into Australia, and then take some business trips to Australia. Have you ever been to Australia? Not yet. Yeah. For some reason, I was thinking that you had been. Katie went last year, and we're talking about uh, we've got to attend a wedding there next year. So Uh, let's get the timing right so I can do business while I'm over there. Start (laughs) start calling some dealers over there. Tell tell them about Lane Shark. Be like, hey, this is what you need. Right. I know we've got people over there that want to buy them because we get emails about them. Oh, for sure. From from Australia. Um. So what, what aspect of your, I know there's probably not a single answer, but like what aspect of your job here do you enjoy the most? Oh man. Figuring stuff out. Just figuring. That, that's the coolest thing is when I came on board, you know, I was very honest. I don't know anything about what you guys do as far as the business side. Like mm-hmm. Kyler showed me the list of software and I went down, I was like, oh, maybe two out of the 20 mm-hmm. I recognized. And a lot of it's pretty intimidating. Like Salesforce is a beast, yeah. but when you can make it do what you need it to do and it makes somebody else's job much easier, that's that aha moment. You're Mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's great. So that part of it, um, I mean, the creative aspect, working with Brandon and the new ideas on on different things. I mean, the 3D model stuff, again, is kind of like always been the core of what I really enjoy. And I still have that opportunity to improve on that. Right. So that's... That'll definitely... We'll definitely get to nurture that a lot more as time comes because or as as the opportunities come because I'm thinking once we get the manufacturing stuff really going we'll, we'll have to find you a replacement and then you can start <laughs> focusing on the 3D design and all that a lot more. Yeah, well, I mean again that the the hope for the future of taking ideas from, you know, what we discuss we're like, "Oh, that's a cool concept." how do we make it a reality? And then mm-hmm. we get hung up on some of the small steps of it or the manufacturing side or the prototyping side, which is a difficult step, but that's 
really the, for the future kind of what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, right now it's just like the time, like my time, because I like putting these ideas into real life, it's, I'm really the only one that can take it from that right. concept to a, a physical object, like a, the little miniature LS or the baby LS3 that we've got. Right. Like I've got the deck and the back plate and the parts cut ready to put together. Right. But 100 percent of my time's over there in the other yeah, shop getting right. getting it ready like it wouldn't take me but probably two days to get it put together exactly but just hard to get to that point so it always comes down to time <laughs> yeah we need to yeah. find me a, find myself a replacement really more than anything right or just clone myself we're getting close uh, hey, the, the tech is getting there <laughs> all you got to do is tell me when and i'll <laughs> we'll go stick a needle in my arm and pull some dna right. out right or just make uh get jack and fitz growing up a little quicker and there you go take take my spot yeah <laughs> that, that, that'll be really cool whenever i can get when they get old enough and they can come in here and oh, actually absolutely. start building stuff yeah i remember my dad had a um, sporting goods retailer store that did screen printing and trophies and then the storefront in, in downtown um i remember just having the best times in the warehouse in the store not necessarily earning the business right but just having fun there yeah you know at these big pile of boxes and when you're a kid that's the greatest thing is building the a box for it oh yeah yeah um so i i'm excited for you to, yeah. to, to you know, i can't see your tell because like i grew up in my mom's hair salon right right I get, go to work with her like basically every saturday i went to work with her and then in the evenings i would get out of school and go have, have to go up there because we live so far mm. out away from everything so growing up in a hair salon like that just seeing that like it one of the things that it instilled in me is like people that are in customer service, mm -hmm. like making sure that you're polite to them, <laughs> that you're understanding that, you know, getting bad service is right. not a personal attack on you. Right. Maybe they're just busy or right. maybe they're having a bad day. Right. Right. So I, I feel like that made me a, a, a lot more empathetic to, to people in the service industry. But yeah, going up there and like, cause it's essentially you're a, a business owner mm -hmm. as a, when you do hair and nails, like right. you, you rent a booth and then you run your business. Right. So that taught me a lot about like being a, a business owner, an entrepreneur or whatever, and like not working for someone else. Right. Yeah. So who knows what they'll get out of coming up here to work. Like they, they may latch onto some other aspect mm -hmm. of it, but just having them up here and being around all those opportunities is, is going to be really exciting. For sure. So hopefully, hopefully they get something good out of it. So, okay, well, anyway, so your dad owned a uh, sporting goods store, so he yeah. did, like, screen printing, is that what you said? Yeah, so up front in, in the retail space was, you know, your typical sporting goods, like a, you know, a champs, essentially. I gotcha. Um, and then custom jerseys for a, a lot of the schools in central New York, um, okay. and then custom T-shirts, um, events, stuff like that. Uh, trophy engraving, um, and then he uh, did a lot of embroidery also. Oh, gotcha. Uh, so kind of like the package deal for, mm -hmm. for schools. Um, that was uh, the bread yeah. and the butter. Uh, really before the internet and online retailing became a, a big thing. It's amazing how many like of those small businesses mm -hmm. died because of the internet. Like, yeah, everything gets consolidated. It's, consolidated. it's nearly impossible to keep up. You know, you can't beat them on price. You can't mm -hmm. beat them on shipping, stuff like that. And, and over the years, that's unfortunately what we saw. You know, and he did well. He just sold um, and retired. Um, still doing some screen printing, which I think he just is enjoying it. Right, um, he just does it to do it. Yeah. Um, but seeing that as a kid always was a big inspiration for me to, you know, run a business. Mm -hmm. um, and in my middle school, high school years, um, opened a DJing business essentially. Um, so all the school dances and then weddings in the, in the local area. Um, and that really kept driving the whole mm. entrepreneurial spirit of, of doing things. So making t-shirts in the screen shop, um, selling them in high school had locker space right at what we called the four corners where all the students would exchange classes and pretty much have to walk through there. Right. <clears throat> so I'd open up shop between classes, open the locker, and there was candy, soda, T-shirts, all we sorts got of things. In trouble for that shit, and, and I don't school. know how I didn't get in trouble. I really don't. I mean, teachers were buying soda, so the vending machines went. You know, the 
the whole push to no sugar in schools mm-hmm. happened right at that time. So it's, well, it's it's an open yeah, market. Gold rush. And it's a really small school, small community. So I felt like, hey, he's not doing anything wrong. It's right. it's all good. He's he's the DJ. He's a good kid. And I got away with it. That's and awesome. and it, it, was, it was great. I mean, he got me my first car. It kind of taught me some, some business aspects. And Yeah, now you get yeah. suspended if you do stuff like that. It's, it's crazy. Ridiculous. I couldn't imagine trying to do it nowadays. <laughs> well, when I was in school, I had uh, my senior year, I had auto body. So it, oh, yeah. we, I had three periods of auto body. Nice. And I was able to... Uh, I was able to bring my truck, my personal truck. I ripped every bit of the interior out and sanded all of it down, painted it like it was like gloss paint, like the outside. Um, I was able to do my whole interior in auto body. And what, what I was getting at, though, is we we figured out we could call Domino's and order pizza. <laughs> and since we were at the school, yeah. they gave us the 50% discount. Oh, cool. So for the second half of my senior year, like almost every other day, we would order Domino's pizza. And uh, one of the other teachers saw the truck come in the back Mm -hmm. one day and told on us and got our teacher. Like, our teacher was cool. Like, we would give him food and uh, got got him in trouble. So then we couldn't do it anymore. And, like, now they don't even have auto body. But before that, my my brother, my stepbrother and my stepsisters went to Tate as well. Okay. When my brother was in school... They they would have like guns in the gun rack in the truck. Right. They got to leave school early. Um, they could leave for lunch and mm. come back. Yeah. yeah. By the time I got there, there was none of that. Oh, and man. then the little bit of freedom that we did have, one teacher told on us and got that taken away. That's unfortunate. And like now, like because Landing just graduated last year, and you know, a couple times I'd have to go pick him up. And like, there's, I mean, they've got everything gated off. You can't get in the school, which that, is for, for protection. I understand right, that. Right. But there is nothing that you can do and get away with in school anymore. And like you said, it, it makes sense for the safety, but that that in itself is just it's I feel, upsetting. I feel like an old geezer. Like if back in I my mean, day, we used to walk the yeah, school uphill. Yeah, and things snow change, before. but it's, I mean, it's strange yeah. though. Like. I mean, statistically speaking, I feel like we're in the safest time that right. we've been in, but all these negative things get right. highlighted all the time, yeah. so everybody freaks out. Right. And I mean, I'm the same. I'm guilty of, of worrying about that too, especially now that I have kids. Like, I think sure. about all that stuff because yeah. you don't want anything to happen right. to your children. But it's almost like every every bit of freedom we give away, we lose liberty yeah. and, like, for every bit of safety we get, we gain, right. we lose liberty. Right. And it's just, it's a weird balance that I don't see fixing itself yeah. anytime soon. I mean, that's that's why I find more rural living mm-hmm. a little bit more attractive than closer or in cities. Is you know, growing up in, in Watkins, there's about two thousand people, you know, in the entire town. Oh wow! So the sense of community was so strong that you just inherently felt safe. It's mm-hmm. like you'd see your friends' parents all the time. I mean. It, it was great. We were walking home from school, you know, about a mile um, to, to my dad's shop, um, starting at like seven years old, maybe. Yep. And no, no fear whatsoever right? on, on both sides. So really having that sense of community, I think, is, is the driving factor behind feeling safe. Um, yeah. And having freedoms, you know, and, and trusting everyone around you. Yeah, that's that's definitely... That's it. Like I haven't, I guess I haven't put it into that that type of context. I just think about the world just getting more separated because of like or we're social living, media. And we're living like, closer and we're more connected online. But more separated, tech. exactly. Right, because you know you go to the grocery store now, and you live nearby, right? Mm-hmm. I don't recognize anybody. I don't stop and talk to anyone. You know, it's. I ran into it. So yesterday I had to go pick up some stuff. Just I had to get like two things from the grocery store. But I'm on the phone with Megan and I'm walking around and there's a guy that I just met last weekend mm. came over to Daniel's house for dinner. And I'm walking and he, he turns around and says, hey, I'm like, hey, man, what's up? And I couldn't remember his name. Oh, and I'm just like, <laughs> I'm on the phone. So I just kind of like scurried off. Like I just, I felt so bad because I'm right. like, this is an opportunity <laughs> to like yeah, right. be a part of the community and everything. And I just... Totally spaced on oh, it. Oh, man. But, uh... Well, next time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> next, yeah. Next time I'll forget just the same. <laughs> I'm bad with names nowadays. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, uh... It is nice. Like, I, I definitely don't want to live in a community. Um, 
where you have, especially like if you have, I'm mean, not a community in a, uh, in the city side type of stuff where you have to worry about so many other things. And like, right. we, uh, we live just up the road, but like, it's kind of rural. I mean, it's on the river, but yeah. it, it's in a neighborhood, but it's like not really an HOA or anything like that right. because they just implement stupid rules. So far, I've, I haven't gotten in any trouble from our little HOA that we have, but I'm looking at buying, <laughs> I'm looking at buying like seven or eight acres. It's in, it's, it's part of the neighborhood technically, but it's not in the HOA at all. Right. So then I can just go all out, no rules, not have to worry about anything. Until your kids get dirt bikes. Uh-huh. And then they're going up and down the street. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, Landon, he, he had that <laughs> stupid, uh, God, I can't think of the name of it. The four-wheeler that he had just recently. And he would get in the neighborhood and just oh, haul man. ass. And like, there's a <laughs> there's a Facebook community. Oh yeah, for the neighborhood. Right, right. <laughs> People would just complain about him. And he, I think he created a fake Facebook and he'd go on and just like egg people on. Of course he would. <laughs> That's He's funny. such a funny kid. <laughs> and he, half the time you think that he just not paying attention and doesn't talk at all, and right. then all of a sudden he'll just hit you with like the funniest stuff. Hey, he's a sharp kid. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. he's always listening and paying attention to what's going on. <laughs> And he just half the time just doesn't want to participate. But when he does, it's, it's hilarious. I love having him <laughs> around. I know the answer, but what are you most excited about in the in the next year or so? I, I mean, the manufacturing expansion, right. for sure, uh, for Lane Shark particularly. Um, yeah, and then just solving more automation. Uh, it seems to be kind of the, the growing trend, which which I'm on board for. Uh, yeah, we definitely got to get all of Ross's stuff automated out because he's going to be. I'm going to pull him out of here and right. put him over there for a little while. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's great, and, and that's the thing is seeing this business grow towards automation is an encouraging thing because a lot of people tend to get comfortable in the way that they do things, and and I like routine for sure, um, but also having new tech or or new ways of doing things that are more efficient mm -hmm. is such a good feeling and i think a lot of businesses tend to lose sight of that you know they're like we've done it this way for 20 years yeah i don't like that and we, we see that sometimes with dealerships is they'll say well we've always done it this way like but this That's way like the most could dangerous be, right uh thing you can say to right me. like not dangerous but it's just aggravating it's like well we've always done it this way so we're always going to do it this way it's like right. well then you're not going to get any different results exactly but right. I, I it's so funny like i i I like my routine. I don't like right. change. But like when it comes to this stuff, if there's something new, exactly, that's what gets me excited. <laughs> right. Like I'm always, always, well, not doing it so much anymore that I've gotten rid of all the social media. But when I come across those things, I'm always mm. sending it to you and Brandon. Right. Like, hey, right. have y'all tried this? Have you tried this? And no. half the time it's stuff that's not even ready to try yet. Right. But it's exciting to see all the stuff that's coming. I'm hoping that the, uh, that phone answering service, like the AI answering service, yeah. like I think that would save a lot of frustration because when when it gets in the busy season and people call, they don't leave a message, right. and then they're like, right. "Blaine Shark doesn't answer the phone." It's like, "Yeah, we're busy, but leave a message, so we'll call you back." Right. But if we can get that AI, like, I think striking a balance with that because nobody likes robocalls or well, no, robo but answers. Just like, if we can, if right. they can make it where it's smooth enough to where exactly. it's like, hey, I am an AI bot, but you can talk well, to me normally. Exactly. Tell me what you need, and I'll and I'll make sure such and such right. calls you right. back immediately. Yeah. And then it just pops up a message on their screen. They know to call right back. Yeah. I mean, it, obviously, there's a balance to be had, but uh, I think it would be, if it's built right. It would be very if helpful. If it's built right, implemented right, yeah. Because there's nothing more frustrating than you're sitting there like. A real person, yeah. please. A real person, please. And That's you're just like, ever, hitting yeah. zero, zero, like trying to get through, you know, calling any business nowadays. Like, oh, we, you know, our menu options have changed. Mm -hmm. like, no, that's, come on. That's yeah. BS. Like, just get me somebody or call me back at least. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, and it, that's the thing. Like, I think that's what will make it a great test of it because I hate that right, personally. Right. And so if we can get it to where I like where you it, don't like, then, yeah, I'll know, right. <laughs> then I'll know that it, we can implement it here. Right. Cause yeah, I, I'm a I'm an old fart when it comes to a lot of that kind of stuff. Like I just want I want to call, I want someone to answer the phone, and I want either to give that person a message or I want to talk to the person I need. So if we can make it smooth and seamless like that, I think it'll be very helpful. So, we're working there. We're, we're you know, oh I know all, I know you are. I, I, <laughs> trust me, I, I I know you're working towards it. But yeah, if uh, 
because a lot of Ross's stuff is is data entry and just keeping right. things straight. So once we get that automated, I think he'll have a lot more time. I kind of mentioned a minute ago, but like, do you think that that's the direction that you kind of want to head? Is like, if as that grows over there, you take in more of the CAD design, and then us bring in an IT guy to kind of fill in your shoes, or what do you? I would love to do more product design mm -hmm. um, and more, you know, the mechanical with tech, you know, mm -hmm. um, that stuff for sure. So perfect. Yeah. Long term, I mean, I'm here to do whatever's necessary for sure. Uh, but, you know, the design side of it really gets me excited and, and seeing, you know, seeing something come from nothing. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, wow, here's a here's an actual physical, tangible product that you can right. use. That's a great feeling. Yeah, we need to try to find a person that is uh, a little more rounded than I am as far as like getting things from conception to production. Because it's like with the one thing that we've been working on since right. you started, right. um, I think that will be a huge hit. It has absolutely nothing to do with brush right. cutters. right. But I think it will be a huge product if we could just figure out how to get over that next little hurdle. Yeah, it's prototyping. That's that's the hard part, yeah. and knowing where to really start with it. That's yeah. the thing. Like I don't even know who to call to ask right. for help right now. Yeah. On that and the few people I've talked to, their price tag has been seemingly. Well, everybody I talked to, they're like, "Oh yeah, uh, we can we can do something with that." And then you try to get them involved, away. and then they disappear. Right. That's happened right. to me twice now. Yeah. Like, I don't really understand what's happening to these people. Like, are they dying or <laughs> the idea is so right. good they're killing people whenever they hear? <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll we'll figure it out for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Are there anything any things that you would like for us to focus on or think about trying to do that we haven't really talked about? Like what's like is there something that you've always wanted to try to do that we could we could do or implement or oh, bring in we're doing it well yeah, when you talk about robots yeah. i was like ah, oh, that's been a dream <laughs> i saw um you know going to fab tech was just like i knew you know robots existed like that but not on that scale um, yeah it was mind-blowing so seeing that just started sparking all sorts of fires and was saying like oh wow we can really do all all these things mm -hmm. so beyond that kind of thing um honestly not really because again you know this work environment that you've created is is really allowed people to to try things and, and be creative um, right. and pitch ideas while being heard you know sometimes they're not great ideas um and you shoot them down in a, in a positive way <laughs> which is you know acceptable for sure but then it's like okay well how can i improve on that idea and mm -hmm. how can we try this um so i've never felt at any point that I wasn't able to speak up and, and say, well, have we tried this or I would like to try this. Um, and I, I think that's kind of what the, the nucleus of Lane Sharks, you know, um, positive work yeah, like, it is. Yeah. I can, it's funny. I was thinking about something similar to that the other day. I, I have always like my friends and everything, I've always tried to get them to do their own thing, mm -hmm. like their own business. Like I remember when I first moved to Greenville, I bought my first house in 2000, the end of 2008. And I had a buddy here that did lawn care and whatnot. And he was wanting to make a change. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, free and move up here. Like I'll buy all the, all the equipment, whatever you need you move up here and start doing all this stuff up here and like have your own thing, like try to do that. And then Kyler, whenever he and I first became friends, I tried to get him to do, um, the videography and mm -hmm. everything that he was interested in. And then he just like, it just kind of like naturally flowed where he came and worked here. But like, I guess what I'm trying to like, I, I want everybody, if everybody here tomorrow, which it would suck, but <laughs> if everybody here tomorrow said, "Look, I'm 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 going to focus on my own thing," right? I'd be like, "I'm happy for you. Congratulations! Yeah, yeah. Like, if you need any help, let me know." Like, I want everybody to be independent, right? And so, not not everybody wants to be independent. So, right. I try to you know make sure you guys have a 
a comfortable life. You guys are always going to get a paycheck, but you have the freedom to to explore those ideas right. and always just bring stuff to me. I, Cause I like the new ideas just as much as anybody exactly. else. Exactly. Right. And even if they're, even if they don't work out, like we can waste some time trying to figure out if they work or not. Right. It's like, that's just a lot of fun. I, I, I love trying to solve problems. So I'm glad that it w- has turned into a good work environment for people. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I've, Throughout my life, I think I've struck kind of the, the boss lottery. Is I can't think of a boss that I've had more than six months that has been bad. That's awesome. But, and it's, you know, the, the bar is pretty high, too, because mm-hmm. um, Rusty was a fantastic boss. And then you is like, I feel pretty fortunate, you know, as far well, as my, my careers have, have gone. I'm glad you do. Um, we, <laughs> I'm very fortunate to have you, man. Like I say, I, I never thought that you would... I never thought that you would leave Coldwater and come, supposed to come work here. So I feel very fortunate to have that because you are, you are my wizard. Appreciate it. So <laughs> I appreciate all that stuff, man. And, uh, I mean, if there's any, nothing else that you want to hit on, we can, and we can end on that. Just that works. I appreciate it. Yeah. Glad to have you and hope you're here till we, till we all I'll, die. I'll be here. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you, Nick. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for listening and getting to know Nick, uh, my wizard. Uh, so if there's any technical problems that you guys run into along the way, you get to you get to talk to him and he gets to fix them for you. So thank you guys for watching. And if you have any suggestions, comments, concerns, or if you want to come on and sit here and bullshit with me, let us know and we'll try to make it happen. Thanks. <laughs>